Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us to Oktoberfest? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Cynthia. And I am Stephanie. You have found the Dark Oak. Happy Halloween, everyone! It's Halloween! (laughs) It is Halloween, and today is unfortunately our final day of Oktoberfest. For this year. Oh, well, indeed. Final episode of Oktoberfest 2023. Yes, that is the year, right? It is. (laughs) Good job. Good job. It's been a long day, guys. It's been a long day. Um, But we have had so much fun enjoying this time with you and i hope that we've given you some laughs we've given you some shivers um but mostly that you just had a great time listening because we have absolutely had a great time um performing for you and um you know letting you be part of our circle so without further ado i have our final campfire story and for those of you that may be joining us for the first time, if a campfire story is not for you, you can go ahead and skip ahead. Campfire stories are just little stories that you may be able to memorize, to share with your friends, your family around a campfire or when you're sitting around the lunch table, anywhere that you want to tell a little story to get you uh, in a spooky mood. So here we are. Again, if you want to get into our full final Oktoberfest episode. Just uh, skip ahead, maybe five, ten minutes, and we'll greet you there. That's right. It's a special Halloween Day episode. It's a bonus. It's a bonus. Cynthia's all about a bonus. All about it. (laughs) All right. Campfire Story is called The Black Ribbon. Oh. Okay. Is this new for you? I'm intrigued. I always love when I can pull out a campfire story that Cynthia hasn't heard. (laughs) Unfortunately, we've hung out a lot, so she hears a lot of my campfire (laughs) stories. So I always love to have a new one. Yes. (laughs) One day, not long after a boy had grown into manhood, he began to notice a young woman who lived in his village. The young woman was shy, but incredibly beautiful. And it didn't take long for the man to develop a courtship with her. Every time they met, He was enchanted with her large blue eyes and the pretty black ribbon she always wore around her neck. The young woman didn't have any living family members, but that did not deter the young man or his family from approving the courtship. A few months came and went, and the happy couple decided to get married. The young man's parents purchased a small cottage for them on the outskirts of town. Time passed, and with it, the couple grew more accustomed to married life. The young man was once blindly enamored with his bride, but soon grew curious about her little quirks and nuances. I feel like that's a nice way to say that. (laughs) That's very nice. Hello, I'm curious about your quirks and nuances. (laughs) But uh, nevertheless, he was particularly curious about her black ribbon, as he never once saw her without it. He had heard strange and scary campfire stories. Oh, maybe they were from me. They, <laughs> they were from the Dark they Oak. They were listeners. They were Dark Oak fans. That's right. <laughs> of course they were. He had heard these strange and scary campfire stories about Black Ribbons as a boy, but never bought into them. When he finally mustered up the courage to ask his wife about the ribbon, she suddenly grew quite stern. She told him that she would never tell him the reason why she wore it, and she and she must never take it off. Confused by this elusive response, the young man grew more and more agitated by the black ribbon. He simply had to know why she must wear it all the time. One morning he woke up and found that his wife was still asleep beside him. 
<clears throat> Quietly, he tiptoed across the cottage to her sewing box. He grabbed a pair of scissors and stood beside his wife's sleeping form. With deft fingers, he cut the ribbon. Within seconds, the man realized why his wife always wore the black ribbon. As the cloth fell from her neck, his wife's head fell clean off her body and rolled across the floor of the cottage. No! <laughs> Not her head! Not her head! Again! <laughs> so this is a lesson to husbands to not go snooping around when you're told to leave it alone. That's right. I told you don't ask me about my... Tonight I'm going to go home and I'll be like, Andy, don't you ask about my black ribbon? Let me tell you what happened to this couple. Believe it or not, this is an, a kid's book. That oh. my, yeah, it's like a kid's like kids campfire stories. Oh, book. fun. And um, yeah, it actually is this very like Victorian looking woman with this like black ribbon. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And um, there we go. All M- right. Missing her head. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Without further ado, let's get into it. Cynthia. Yes, Stephanie. Have you ever been to Ireland? No, it's on my bucket list. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So I went when I was in college and fell in love with it. Fell in love. So much so that in my late 20s, when, you know, I was single, didn't have kids, wasn't really exactly sure. I was in a job, but it wasn't really going where I wanted it to go. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to move there. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was pretty close to pulling the trigger on that. And then I met Barton. I I just felt like it was a land of magic. Oh, for sure. I, I mean, like anything is kind of possible. And depending on where you are, like the wooded areas have this like mystical, hazy mm. properties. And even the rolling hills, I mean, you can see them for miles and miles. And they're these little stone walls and they're like dotted with sheep. Um, I fell in love with this little town called La Hinch. Okay. It's on the coast. So if you look to one of your, like one side, it's like this dark cliff with like beautiful blue water. And then you look to the other side and there are rolling green hills with sheep. So it's literally the best of both worlds. You get the coastal like magic, but then you also get like the lush countryside and the let's go. I want to go. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. I literally wrote in the the notes here. I was like, let's go. (laughs) Match made in heaven. Now it stands to reason that a lot of lore that we know comes from Ireland. So you say Ireland, everybody thinks leprechauns, right? Yes. But did you also know that the Banshee comes from Ireland? That comes from, yeah, mythical creatures in Ireland. And the Banshee is known all around, but it started as an Irish legend, an Irish, an Irish myth. So that's also my intro to say the rest of the story is going to get a little scary, a little, little scary, oh. a, little, a little hairy, a little crazy. <laughs> I like it. Bring it on, Lassie. All right. So this is going to include the tale of a haunted Irish castle Ooh. with a dwelling called the Ghost Room. <laughs> Oh, yes. (laughs) Right up my alley. The castle I'm referencing is called Bali Galley. It is so called because it is located in the village of Bali Galley in Northern Ireland. The castle overlooks the sea at the head of the Bali Galley Bay on the beautiful Antrim coast. And this coastline follows several provenances in Ireland, um, but Usler is the one that it's known, like it most notably crosses. Okay. And, I've heard of Usler. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's just stunning. Mm. Stunning. Now, Usler is one of the four traditional Irish provenances. In the 1600s, it was the last holdout for the Gaelic traditional way of life. Now, we know the word Gaelic to represent a language spoken by the original inhabitants of Ireland and Scotland, but it also has a lot of cultural significances to it. So I mention this because this 
land has a lot of history where this castle now stands. In 1640, after horrible, horrible wars where many people died, King James I colonized Usler with English-speaking Protestant settlers from Great Britain. Okay. Usler, along with the rest of Ireland, became part of the United Kingdom in 1801. He was just like, well, this is mine now. And so he started to kind of crush out a lot of the Gaelic community. But 200 years later in the 20th century, when Ireland was moving towards self-rule, many Usler Protestants wanted to stay part of the UK. So they were like, yeah, okay, Ireland's moving to their own thing, but we're still from Great Britain. So they identified much more with the British way of rule. So that's how the the country of Ireland is now split. So part of it is still under UK rule and part of it is independent Ireland. And Usler is still part of that UK rule. Okay. All right. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting too. And I feel like that adds to kind of the lore of this castle, you know, and it's history that we don't even have in the United States. Right. Um, you know, all these hundreds of years of war and turmoil and, um, the castle was built in 1625. Again, that's right at the midst of all of this, like Protestant, you know, newcomers, um, you know, pushing out the original inhabitants. And it was built by Lord James Shaw of Scotland. And he rented the land from Randall MacDonald, the Catholic Earl of Antrim, for 24 pounds a year. Wow. Now, we did the conversion as best we could into U.S. dollars because in 1625, dollars didn't even exist. Right. I mean, think that. Like, this is what right. we're talking like, about here. A whole different world. Exactly. But the best we could figure out the by the power of spending, it would be about $3,600. A year? Yes. So still so, a fantastic deal. Still, like, a ridiculous deal. Okay. Exactly. Like, even a month, that would be like... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. So, Lord James Shaw was like, well, I've got this enormous estate. I'm going to build me a castle. Why not? Why not? Now, the castle was built in a uh, more French style. It has a rectangular castle, and it has four stories, and the walls are about five foot thick. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if anyone knows, but Cynthia's... <laughs> a bit vertically challenged. I'm pretty sure the walls are thicker than Cynthia is tall. I am exactly five feet tall. So. <laughs> okay, so I was pretty close. <laughs> you were. You thought I was shorter than five feet? I mean, come on. I'm just I'm just giving our listeners, you know, a, a, a visual. visual. Exactly. A proper visual. <laughs> exactly. So picture Cynthia laid out and that's how thick the walls okay. were. <laughs> but as you can imagine, this was a super valuable thing, you know, with all these um you know, restless times. Absolutely. In history, right? I'd be thankful for that, Cynthia Wall. Exactly. <laughs> so four stories high. And then at the top of the castle. The wall is four stories high. The wall. So the castle and the walls. So these are the actual walls of the castle. Oh, okay. It's not a wall surrounding the castle. That's the actual <gasps> castle, castle walls, walls themselves. Are f oh, I misunderstood. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So... So it's not going anywhere. Uh, no. Okay. No, very fortified. Okay. And at the top of the four corners were turrets. So turrets are like those little round pointy things mm -hmm. at the top that you relate with castles. And then it had a very large tower in the northeast side that had a gigantic spiral staircase going up into the tower. Over the main entrance door to the castle leading to the tower is the medieval Scots inscription God's providence is my inheritance. Okay. Okay. Now, all that means is they're trusting in God's yeah. provisions and God's guidance, and they're going to trust God to guide them through the journey of their life. It's nice. I like it. It actually is a really nice little instance. I had to think about it, but I was like, no, I like that. That's yeah. positive. Yeah, absolutely. So the castle served as a, a refuge for Protestants during many of these civil wars because um, Lord Shaw was like, hey, y'all, come on in. And um, at that time, um, it had a an additional protective wall around it, and the Irish garrison was never able to get through. 
Okay. Um, so they tried to overtake the castle several times and were never successful. Now, in 1840, that small protective wall that is around the castle was taken down to make room for the road that goes along the Antrim coast. So somebody kind of had this idea that tourism uh, might be better <laughs> than the historic. Than protecting the historic <laughs> castle exactly. that, you know, protected them so many times. Now, before. yes, exactly. Now, the castle itself untouched. The little wall had to be taken down. Sure. And it was probably worth it. I've seen pictures. Okay, okay. <laughs> it was probably it worth was it. It was obstructing the view. Exactly. It's really pretty neat okay. what they did there. Um, now, it is reputed to be the oldest occupied building in Ireland which is really saying something. It's the only 17th century building still used as a residence in Northern Ireland. And most fun and relevant to this podcast, it is reputed to be one of the most haunted places in all of Usler. Ooh. I bet. It's seen a lot. Now, a fun fact before we get into that. Okay. I, just, I, <laughs> I laugh every time that I look at it. In 1760, the castle buildings were extended as the squire, Henry Shaw, okay, squire in this case just means you own land. Okay. So he owned the land. All right. Um, but Henry Shaw married Miss Hamilton, who had two sisters, who she insisted needed to come live with her at the castle. So they extended the castle just to have her sisters come. Because the one castle wasn't big enough? She needed to extend the castle for her sisters. Sure. Okay. Actually... I'm not really sure whose idea it was. Maybe it was his. He was like, well, if they're going to come, I'm building them their own wing. <laughs> that sounds more accurate. <laughs> Maybe honestly. that's probably the case. <laughs> I love it. Now, in 1799, the castle passed to William Shaw, who was the last squire of Ballygally. The family's wealth was exhausted, and within a few years, he sold the property. Wah, wah. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. However, it passed through several hands after that, including use as a Coast Guard station before being purchased in the early 1950s by Cyril Lord. Have you ever heard of Cyril Lord? I don't think so. Okay, he's kind of fascinating in his own way. Um, he is a textile millionaire, so basically deals in fabrics and stuff, who refurbished the castle, castle and added basically the hotel portion to the castle. If you look at it, there's like the original castle, and then there's the hotel portion, and that's what it looks like today. What's fun about Cyril Lord is that he made the first readily consumable like rugs and carpets in the 1950s, because before then it was all really natural fibers like wool and silk that were very expensive. But of course, this is post-war. Everybody wants to like have the nicest furnishings. And so he figured out how to make these synthetic rugs and sell them really affordably. And his slogan was, this is luxury you can afford from Cyril Lord. <laughs> But he came in and totally, like, redid the whole castle and made it to what it is today. Okay. Now, the castle is reputed to host a number of ghosts. Most of the hauntings are attributed to James Shaw, James Shaw's wife, Lady Isabel Shaw, who Lord Shaw married shortly after he completed construction of Ballygally Castle. She mostly stays in the castle section. She doesn't always travel to the hotel side, but she has been known to do so. Okay, it makes sense that she would stay where she knew. Yeah. I'm going to tell you why. Oh. The story goes that Lord James Shaw wanted a son and an heir, but Isabel birthed a daughter. Consequently, he snatched the baby away from her and locked her in a room in the tower on the far side of the castle with only a small window overlooking the sea. He locked his wife in the room? Exactly. Took the baby and locked her in the room. Um, there are even rumors that he starved her, he tortured her, was just not a nice dude. And she wanted to get back to the baby. Of course. You know, wanted to escape. But her only way was to basically climb through this five-foot wall to the window and try to like jump out like into the sea she did she did not make it now there are some other rumors that maybe she was pushed out the window by one of his henchmen and even that i was kind of like okay well 
if they didn't have a son, first off, why didn't they just try for another kid? So there's another rumor that she may have been having a uh, affair with a semen. And so this could have been like her love child that she was pregnant with. And so he locked her in the tower. Okay, so he would have known that it wasn't his. Somehow he found out it wasn't his. Okay. So anyway, took the baby, locked her in the tower. Okay. So whatever the circumstances are, she got locked in the tower. That makes more sense. And especially like if he knew that actually he is the one who determines the sex of the child. Like, do they know that in 1840? No, but like, I wish I could tell him now. Not even 1840. 1625. Yeah. Definitely didn't know in 1625. (laughs) But that just always gets me. All these kings like so mad at their wives for like giving birth to girls when it's like, first of all. Yeah. You determined that. Yes, exactly. I digress. So either way, fell to her death. And now she haunts the castle looking for her baby. That is the saddest thing I've ever heard. It is really sad, actually. And do we know what happened to the baby? No, we don't. So either way, probably not good because it was either a girl he didn't want or a love child. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we don't really know. Okay. We just know that she and Isabel have not been reunited. Now, the room that she jumped from is now referred to as the ghost room. Of course it is. And I have seen pictures of this room because it is left exactly as it was (laughs) when she met her device. (laughs) That is so creepy. And it it, it is very creepy. Um, It is a small little room. It has a wrought iron bed, like a cot bed in the corner. And it's covered in this like red, like patchwork quilt thing um it has a basic dressing table with a little small mirror a chair and a few old pictures on the wall one of which is supposedly lady shaw but it's one of these super creepy lady black and white pictures where it looks like her eyes are like following you around the room oh my goodness it is so creepy um and there's that tiny window which again is sunk like five feet into the wall so it's like a tunnel like leading to the window um it's a little it's a little unnerving (laughs) yeah yeah and especially thinking she was up there for such like a long time and in such grief and distress like exactly that's very awful so we'll post a little pic for you guys on socials so you can check that out um now isabel haunts the hotel looking for her daughter um guests have experienced unexplained noises have felt a presence in their room. There are often knocks on the door, but when they open the door, there's no one there. Isabel's presence is has often resulted in huge temperature fluctuations and odd smells. Hmm. Exactly. Um, and this is a pretty per- pervasive thing. People think they smell her. And the smell is overwhelming of musty vanilla that's interesting yeah is it so, like her perfume or something or we I don't, don't know. know but musty vanilla musty vanilla and one person even described it as like a blanket of smell on you like just like covered in the smell heavy oppressive yeah and then as soon as the presence goes away like it just disappears like it's not like it kind of lingers it's like there and it is not okay now, in 2003, Olga Henry, the manager manager of the Bali Galley Hotel at the time, told a spooky story about a business guest who was staying in one of the rooms uh, beneath the tower, the beneath the in the tower beneath the ghost room. Okay, so they have the tower also has hotel rooms, oh, and yeah. that's the original. Yeah, so the whole hotel still has. Well, the the, the whole, whole castle still has hotel rooms okay um but the tower specifically has four rooms under it okay and a guest was staying in one of these four rooms um he was staying for business and he woke up in the middle of the night and he was laying face down on the bed and for a moment he thought he was back home you know that moment like between consciousness and you're like yeah "Yeah, where am i and again he was laying on his back and he thought he felt one of his young children put a hand on his back. 
Okay. But then he realized he was not at home and it was not his child. So he sat up in bed and could hear a child running and laughing around the room, but he couldn't see anything. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So he ran downstairs to the front desk in the middle of the night in his boxer shorts and told them he was going to need a different room. At least he doesn't sleep naked. You know? <laughs> it could have been worse. <laughs> Good it could have been worse. And you know what I had to say? Kid g- ghosts are like so scary. Like it's the scariest kind. You know, I've heard that a lot from people. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel like, eh. I don't know. I feel like somehow they're more comforting, but I've you're not alone in saying yeah, that's any kind of, of kid ghost or it's that's just it. creepy. That's out. That's out. Now Olga admitted that she didn't really believe in the whole ghost hype um, when she started working at the hotel, but definitely agrees there's something supernatural going on. Okay. For instance, she herself had an encounter one night. Um, she was planning a dinner in the castle in december of 2003 and what is called the dungeon room (laughs) that sounds lovely (laughs) can i stay in the dungeon room (laughs) well i will clarify the castle has two private dining rooms that they use for private parties one of them is called the dungeon room okay so i think they've kind of played on this whole sure of course a little bit yes but they were having dinner in the dungeon room, and um, they were a, as a group of uh, directors, actually. And so she said, okay, these are kind of prominent people. We want to make sure they have a really lovely, like, private dining service upon their arrival, which was going to be the next day. So she and her staff went up and arranged the whole room. Um, they, they set the table, the glasses were sparkling, the candelabra was set just right. The linens were placed perfectly. And when they were all done, she ushered everybody out of the room, closed the door behind her and locked the door. The next day, Olga went to the dungeon to just unlock the door. So if her guests wanted to maybe view the room before they went in to go dine, what she found was a complete mess oh my goodness the napkins were unfolded and strewn around the table the glasses were in a circle around the table like on the ground yes (laughs) here's the weirdest part the table the candelabra the mirror that the candelabra was sitting on and the glasses were all covered in what she described as a scum she said it wasn't like a dust. It was like not easily wiped off. Like soap scum almost, kind of. Or like a greasy, yeah. like scummy, like something. But it was nowhere else in the room. Whatever the substance was, was nowhere else in the room. It wasn't on the floor. It wasn't on other surfaces. It was just over the table and what had ever been on the table. That's really weird. And so like, okay, at first my mind goes to, okay, maybe like. An employee or somebody like that, like, went in there and messed all this up. I don't know why you would. But, like, even if I were going to go in and just, like, tick my boss off and, like, undo all the work she did the day before to, like, put grease or scum all over. Like, you know what I mean? That's just not, like, what a human would do. Yeah. It just kind of weirded me out. And also the way she was describing. So here are these glasses sitting around the table. And the glasses have scum. But, like the floor does it so clearly you know i'm thinking it's an old it's an old castle maybe like part of the ceiling was falling or maybe there was like some kind of dust or something you know what i'm saying sure. like i mean because there's all kinds of old stuff of in course. an old dwelling but none of it would describe why it wasn't on like the sideboard why it wasn't right. on the chairs it was only on the things on the table that's weird yeah the restaurant manager um, Norma Craig, who served at Bali Galley for 23 years, also reported some strange happenings. The first occurred around Christmas when the hotel was already closed to guests. The whole staff gathered around the fireplace in the lounge for a festive drink and to celebrate the holy day. Everyone was huddled together and then suddenly they heard footsteps th- from the reception, even though all the staff were in the lounge. She recalled that the whole hallway then started echoing and in a fleeting moment the glasses on the table in the lounge started sliding from the table and smashing onto the floor oh 
She also said that in the garden restaurant, after the restaurant is closed, witnesses have seen cutlery spinning on the table, even when no one is near them. Okay, that would freak me the heck out. Sure. Okay, and, like, the only thing I can think of is, like, and uh, I'm no expert, but you know that, like, weird phenomenon where, like, I don't know, like, magnets, like, in the, or, like, those yeah. areas where they have, like, reverse gravity almost and, like, you know, maybe, like, but those are in certain spots that are known for having those kinds of things happening. So, if, and it wouldn't affect your glassware, like the glassware flying off the, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So yeah, I'm just grasping at straws here. Like what could this be? <laughs> Some, but uh, no, it's just nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good try though. <laughs> Case solved. <laughs> now mediums have spent the night at the castle and several of them have reported that they detect more ghosts than actual guests staying at the hotel so i think there were many that could be causing any of these supernatural occurrences scott weatherup the general manager of the bali galley castle has said despite the tragic tale lady isabel's ghost has a friendly spirit and can be spotted wandering along the castle's corridors she's very much part of the history of the hotel and our guests love to hear her story and visit the ghost room so on that note the bali galley does not offer ghost tours but you can go visit the ghost room and there are pictures i've seen online of people like sitting in her little chair i would not do that <laughs> i would feel maybe weird. i would take a picture from like the doorway or something but i'm not i'm not actually gonna go in there i would be curious how to um i would be curious how she reacts to children being like do they have they ever had any child guests or babies in the castle like and how does she react to that does anything happen or because you would think if she's looking you know what i mean all i've heard is over and over how she's a very kind spirit so maybe she doesn't appear to kids because she doesn't want to like freak them out scare them yeah right um, or they just don't know that she's an apparition like they right. think you know she's a real person or right something. so they don't ever tell anyone because i i don't feel like i would be afraid of her because yeah. she's just a mom looking for a baby yeah like she's not now, if she's taking revenge, that's different. <laughs> but she seems very no. much just like... Everyone, I mean, everyone that works at the hotel has always said, I mean, except for the guy that felt the weird kid, but, you right. know. But that, that would have been a different not, ghost altogether. Exactly. Maybe, maybe that's her daughter. I know. Since we don't exactly know what happened to her. Could right. Be, could be. Um, Jeff Ballinger, in his book, The World's Most Haunted Places, said Bali Galley Castle Hotel offers a combination of old world charm and some feisty Irish spirits. If you do happen to get a strange knock at your door in the middle of the night, do be kind to Lady Shaw. The poor girl's been through a lot. Aww. <laughs> I went, I feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. So last little tidbit about Bali Galley Castle, if you're going to visit. Um, if you are into Game of Thrones, the Bali Galley Castle sits right around the area where uh, large portions of Game of Thrones was filmed. And all along the Antrim coast, they used castles and hotels along that strip to house the cast and the crew while they were filming and bali galley castle is number nine on their hotel tour they actually have an enormous wooden carved door in the castle that represents the battle between house stark and house bolton so How if you're out there you can check it out yeah a little bit of game of thrones yeah. knowledge there now are you a game of thrones fan i could not get into it i i really was into the dragons mm -hmm. um i don't know maybe our listeners don't know but i i have a my own flock of chickens and i consider them baby dinosaurs and so i was really into kind of the idea of like mother of dragons but yes. that's about as far as i got okay i liked the idea of it i just couldn't handle the violence more specifically the gore like I don't, mm. I love scary, I love creepy, I don't like gore, and so it it was gory for the sake of just being gory. Yeah, and uh, so I couldn't get past too many seasons. Oh, but that said, I think you and I are the exception because I know it's a big deal. 
It, it, well, and it, I'm sad that I couldn't watch it because I did like follow <laughs> it. Like yeah. I followed it and I could tell you how it, what happened, but I just couldn't watch it. But really cool. Like I could read the books. Well, yeah. I, I feel like books are always better than the shows anyway. Yeah, for sure. That's really cool. And I can, as you're describing it, as I, I can like see the, um, I can see Game of Thrones and like where it occurred and like, yeah, you're right. That's exactly like what I'm imagining for this castle. Yeah. That's very cool. All right. Well, guys, that's our uh, haunted Irish ghost story um, in the Bali Galley Castle. Very cool. Thanks for telling us. Join us next week for more thrills and chills. Thanks for joining us at the Dark Oak. Bye-bye. Bye. This has been a Just Us Gals production with artwork by Justice Holmes and music by Ryan Creighton.